If everyone could uh, just take their seats, and then we can begin. Shana Tova, Gmar Chatima Tova. This year, as we renew ourselves and as we renew our synagogue, it is fitting that we imbue this new, old space again with the spirit of Rabbi Gunter Plout, and that we renew the Rabbi W. Gunter Plout Humanitarian Award. Rabbi Plout was, of course, our senior rabbi from 1961 to 1977. He was a senior scholar at this temple for 25 years after that. Sorry, he was a senior scholar at this temple for 25 years after that, and he was the head of the Canadian Jewish Congress, and of course, that's enough to fill a lifetime of work, and yet it barely describes him and his impact. He was a giant among Jewish thinkers. The Chumash, or the Torah commentary in your pews, was his work. It was the first English language commentary for congregational use ever produced outside of the Orthodox tradition, and it was his gift to Jews all over the world. And he wasn't just a giant among Jews. He co-founded Toronto's Urban Alliance for Race Relations. He served as vice chair of the Ontario Human Rights Commission for seven years. He received 19 honorary degrees. And he's invested not only in the Order of Ontario and the Order of Canada, but also remarkably in the German Order of Merit, the highest civilian order of that country. The 10 people who have already received this award reflect the breadth of Rabbi Plout's commitment to human dignity. They include physicians who placed medicine at the service of human rights, like Dr. Fraser Mustard and Dr. James Rubinsky. They include philosophers and theologians who sent ideas into action for our most vulnerable neighbors, people like Jean Vanier and Mary Jo Letty. They included people like Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire who did not walk away from a genocide. First and last and in between though, Rabbi Plout was a husband to Elizabeth, a father to Jonathan and to Judith, who I believe we are blessed to have among us today, and a grandfather and a great-grandfather. And though I was still a boy in this congregation when Rabbi Plout was at his height, it seems to me that his work stemmed from a belief that we Jews must constantly discover new things in our relationship with God. As he put it once, Jews today are entitled to insights that go beyond the traditional. We have a special copy of his Chumash in our home that my grandmother gave to our son in 2002. Like Rabbi Plout, my grandmother had escaped Central Europe just before the Holocaust. And like Rabbi Plout, she found her ultimate refuge, I suppose, 60 years later in that big white high rise on the corner of Bathurst and St. Clair. And one day, she went downstairs to his apartment, Chumash in hand, to ask him to sign his name inside the volume. And back inside her apartment, my grandmother wrote an inscription next to Rabbi Plout's signature. Dear Adam, it read, may this book be a memento of the day when you entered the Jewish covenant with God. By then it seemed that Rabbi Plout was again worried about Jewish survival. He delivered one of his last sermons here in this room on Kol Nidre. And as I recall, he sounded afraid that night that we were weakening, dispersing, leaving behind us the bridge that links our Jewish calling to the world, Torah. I wish he had known on that Kol Nidre how strong we really were and are because we had been listening to his lessons. In his commentary on Deuteronomy chapter 29, which we read on Yom Kippur, Rabbi Plout writes that we are who we are because of our ancestors. And I wish he'd had the chance to see how fully and how adventurously his rabbinical descendants like Rabbi Splansky are delivering on his teaching that God gave us the Torah so that we, in this place, at this moment, might help God continually renew the work of creation. Before Gunther Plett was a rabbi, he was a lawyer, trained at the University of Berlin, denied the opportunity to practice by the corruption of law. This afternoon, in joining his name to that of Rosalia Bella, the glow of Rabbi Plout's Shem Tov, of his good name, is an invitation for us to consider justice. To introduce us to Madam Justice Abella, it is my honor now to welcome the Honorable Barbara Conway, a member of our congregation and a judge of the Superior Court of Justice of Ontario. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the definition of a humanitarian is, quote, a person who seeks to promote human welfare. 
Justice Rosalie Silberman Abella is a humanitarian in every sense of the word. In her role as lawyer, educator, and judge, she has promoted human welfare through her lifelong commitment to human rights, equality, and justice. Justice Abella was born in 1946 in a displaced persons camp in Stuttgart, Germany. Prior to the war, her father Jacob had received a law degree from the Jagiellonian Jagiellonian University in Krakow. After the war, he was appointed by the Americans as the head of legal services for residents of the displaced persons camp that he was in. However, on the family's arrival to Canada in 1950, the Law Society told Jacob that he was unable to practice law in Ontario as he was not yet a Canadian citizen, a process that would take five years. Jacob became an insurance agent. His young daughter, Rosalie, then four years old, recognized the unfairness of it all. She made up her mind that she would become a lawyer, even though she really didn't know what a lawyer was. She just wanted to become what her father was not allowed to be. And so she did. Justice Abella was called to the Ontario Bar in 1972 and started practicing law. Among other things, she became a member of the Ontario Human Rights Commission. She also became the chair of and authored a study on access to legal services by the disabled. In 1976, Justice Abella was appointed to the Ontario Family Court. She was 29 years old at the time. She was the first Jewish woman judge in Canadian history. She was the youngest judge appointed in Canada, and with her second son, Zachary, on the way, Canada's first pregnant judge. Justice Abella has said that her experience on the family court, where she had to decide whether to take people's children away from them, taught her to see the law from the experiences of the people who were before her. In a conversation with the Dean of Law at Fordham University in 2018, Justice Abella said, and I quote, looking at the law and justice from their eyes taught me how to be a judge through all the rest of my judicial career. Justice Abella served as the chair of the Ontario Labor Relations Board from 1984 to 1989. She was the first female chair. For the next three years, she served as the chair of the Ontario Law Reform Commission, the first woman in the British Commonwealth to head a law reform commission. In 1992, she was elevated to the Ontario Court of Appeal. Twelve years later, in 2004, she was appointed to our country's highest court, the Supreme Court of Canada. Justice Abella displays her Jewish heritage proudly. The first paragraph of her biography on the Supreme Court of Canada website states, quote, she is the first Jewish woman appointed to the court, close quote. Justice Abella is also now the longest serving judge on our Supreme Court. In a commencement speech given at Brandeis University in 2017, describing lessons that the world was supposed to have learned from the Holocaust, Justice Abella stated, indifference is injustice's incubator. It's not just what you stand for, it's what you stand up for. And we can never forget how the world looks to those who are vulnerable. Those principles have guided and informed Justice Abella's work and career over the last 50 years. In 1983, she was appointed the sole commissioner of the Federal Royal Commission on Equality in Employment to look at barriers in the workplace for women, Aboriginal people, visible minorities, and those with disabilities. In her 1984 report, she created the term and concept employment equity to address issues of inequality in the workplace. Her report was implemented by the Government of Canada and as well by the governments of New Zealand, Northern Ireland, and South Africa. 
Five years later, in 1989, the Supreme Court of Canada decided its first case on equality rights under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms in the case of Andrews versus the Law Society of British Columbia. A lawyer from England had been restricted from practicing law in British Columbia because he was not a Canadian citizen. The Supreme Court held that the citizenship requirement violated the equality guarantee in the Charter and struck down the law. In a lovely twist of history, the Court used the concepts of equality and discrimination developed by Justice Abella in her 1984 report to strike down the very law that had prevented her father from practicing law in Canada decades earlier. As a judge of the Supreme Court of Canada, Justice Abella is called upon to balance competing constitutional rights of Canadians. In determining these difficult legal issues, she remains acutely aware of the individual at the center of the legal storm. In the 2012 case of RVNS, the issue before the court was whether a Muslim woman testifying in a sexual assault trial was required to remove her niqab to show her face in court, and whether that violated the accused's right to a fair trial. Justice Abella, in her reasons, considered the impact on the woman of requiring her to remove her niqab, stating, quote, the harmful effects of requiring a witness to remove her niqab with the result that she will likely not testify, bring charges in the first place, or if she is the accused, be unable to testify in her own defense, is a significantly more harmful consequence than not being able to see a witness's whole face. In addition to her work as a judge, Justice Abella is an educator and a scholar. She has written over 90 articles and written or co-edited four books. She has been a visiting professor at both McGill University and the University of Toronto Law Schools. She has been active in judicial education with initiatives that include organizing the first judicial seminar in which all levels of Canada's judiciary participated and then the first national conference for Canada's female judges. Justice Abella has been widely honored and recognized for her work. She has received countless awards for her work in human rights law and equality. Most recently, she was awarded the inaugural University of Toronto's Rose Wolf Distinguished Alumni Award for 2019 for what was described as a life of exemplary achievement and contribution, her pioneering work on equality and discrimination, her commitment to improving justice through judicial education, and her public service in so many other ways. Justice Abella has received 39 honorary degrees. She was the first Canadian woman to receive an honorary degree from Yale Law School in 2016, and the first Canadian Supreme Court judge to receive an honorary degree from Johns Hopkins University this past spring. In 2018, she was the first Canadian judge to become an elected member of the American Philosophical Society, that country's oldest learned society, for which she was recognized as, quote, a leading voice for human rights among judges of the world's high courts. And despite her lifetime of achievements and accolades, Justice Bella is very much a human herself. She is a loving mother, a wife, and a grandmother. Anyone hearing her speak, as you all will in a moment, can feel the warmth, compassion, and humanity that radiate from her. Fellow members of the congregation and guests, we are lucky to have Justice Rosalie Abella with us today. You see before you a woman who is a role model for others. She has used the experience of her family and people to motivate her to help others. She has used her innate intellect, her endless energy, and her compassion and empathy 
to promote human welfare, to promote human rights, equality, and justice. That, members and guests, is a humanitarian. And that, members and guests, is why Justice Rosalie Silberman Abella is so supremely deserving of the Rabbi W. Gunter Plout Humanitarian Award. I now call upon our congregants, Michael Bernstein and his mother, Miriam Berthos, to present the Rabbi W. Gunther Plout Humanitarian Award to Justice Abella. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Our family is very pleased to be involved with the Plout Humanitarian Award. This is an homage not only to the continuing need to recognize champions, such as yourself, but also to pay tribute to our ancestor, René Cassin, who helped draft the Declaration of Human Rights and won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1968. And also to my grandmother, Hélène Berthoz, his niece, who, my mom's mom, who remained involved with the Institute of Human Rights well into her, in her 90s. My grandmother, so my mom, Mimi's mom, lost her father at the age of two in the First World War. Her dad was killed, as many French soldiers were. René Cassin was her mother's little brother, and with no kids of his own, he had a particularly close relationship with his nieces and nephews, and in turn, their kids. So although he was an accomplished scholar, statesman, activist, judge, and diplomat, he was always Uncle René, Uncle René, to us, and was like a true grandfather to my mom. For me, he looked like a Jewish, slightly balding Santa Claus with a snowy white beard and a twinkle in his eye. René Cassin was an avid student and admirer of Jewish teachings and values, and saw the inherent value of universal principles both from a legal as well as moral imperative. But as we reflect during the high holidays, it is a fact that our family all remember this man not as a noble laureate, but as a kind, gentle, humble person who would always mediate family squabbles and welcome someone into his home with a hot tea or cocoa for the kids. So I find it comforting that in thinking about the legacy of this great man, and as we honor today this great Canadian woman, it comes down to a very Jewish concept that all starts at home. Mom? I would add that my great uncle, René Gassin, used to greet us with champagne at 11 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> even when we are very small. To thank for human, to work for human rights, is to work for the intangible. You cannot hold them, see them, touch them. In our materialistic society, this is the hardest thing to do. Thank you, Mrs. Isabella, for dedicating your life to justice and human rights. We've been here for so many bar mitzvahs, I feel like saying, today I am a man. <laughs> Justice Conway, that was extraordinary. Thank you so much for taking the time and the trouble to dig deep and have my life flash before me. Um, I appreciate the warmth and the generosity. And I want to say to the family of Rene Cassin, it is quite extraordinary. This is a day of remembrance. And to be uh, remembering René Cassin and Gunther Plout is to remember the people on whose shoulders those of us who care about those issues stand. So thank you for making this 
so special for me. Gunther Plaut was an extraordinary intellectual and humanist, a man who cared deeply about being Jewish and thought that being Jewish gave us special responsibilities to everyone else. Gunther and I served on the Ontario Human Rights, together, Rights Commission together in the 70s. So I had the chance to watch him up close and personal for years. He was wise, sensitive, and fearless. How often did I hear him say, Rosie, this matters. We have to take a stand. So in preparing short remarks for this afternoon, I heard him say, Rosie, it's Yom Kippur, the most serious day in the Jewish calendar. Talk about what matters. So Gunther, here goes. Jewish values, Jewish ideals, and of course, remembrance. We're on the edge of a new future, one unlike any I've seen in my lifetime. It's a future that's very divisive, very insensitive, and at times, very macho. That makes it very dangerous. The moral climate is changing the world and creating an atmosphere polluted by bombastic anti-intellectualism, sanctimonious incivility, and a moral free-for-all. Everyone is talking and no one is listening. It was not supposed to be like this. In June, we commemorated the 75th anniversary of D-Day, when the Allies landed in Normandy. It allowed justice to emerge assertively from the injustices of World War II and led to the miraculous regeneration and luminous moral consensus that resulted in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Genocide Convention, and the Nuremberg Trials those moral phoenixes that rose from the ashes of Auschwitz, all created to preserve the conceptual fruits of victory. 75 years later, this is not by any stretch the best of all possible worlds. The moral legacies that emerged triumphant from the beaches of Normandy, the legacies each and every one of us is descended from, are at risk. Those legacies are democracy, human rights, and justice. And when they're at risk, our humanity is at risk. World War II was the devastating war that inspired the nations of the world to unite in democratic solidarity and commit themselves to the promotion and protection of values designed to prevent a repetition of the war's, the war's unimaginable human rights abuses against Jews. Yet here we are in 2019, more than seven decades later, watching that wonderful democratic consensus fragment all over the world as the world rediscovers its pathological attraction to anti-Semitism. We are rolling back hard-fought human rights for minorities, immigrants, refugees, workers, and women. We are forgetting our compassion and making the vulnerable more vulnerable in a world that was supposed to have learned the horrendous cost of discrimination so that being different would no longer expose someone to danger. We are a world now where too often law and justice are in a dysfunctional relationship and where, as we saw in the last few months at a synagogue in Poway in Pittsburgh, in a mosque in New Zealand, and in churches in Sri Lanka, a world where prejudice poisons and hate kills. Democracy is too fragile in too many parts of the globe. Too many democratic institutions and values are thrown under the bus. And too often, the truth is victim to political expediency. Too many rights abuses go unrecognized, let alone confronted. Too many governments have interfered with the independence of their judges and media. Too many people are strident. Too many people have been killed. Too many people are poor. Too many children are hungry. And too many people have lost hope. We are in danger of a new status quo where anger triumphs over dignity and indignity triumphs over decency. 
and where intolerance is tolerated and tolerance is not. Too much like the old status quo we fought a world war to fix. As you heard in Justice Conway's wonderful address, my parents, who got married in Poland on September the 3rd, 1939, the day World War II officially started, spent most of the war in concentration camps. Their two and a half year old son, my brother, and my father's parents and three younger brothers were all killed at Treblinka. My father was the only person in his family to survive the war. He was 35 when the war ended, my mother was 28. As I reached each of those ages, I tried to imagine how they felt when they faced an unknown future as survivors of an unimaginable past. And as each of our two sons reached the age my brother had been when he was killed, I tried to imagine my parents' pain in losing a two and a half year old child, and I couldn't. After the war, my parents went to Germany where my father, as you heard, a lawyer who graduated with a master's in law from Jagiellonian University in Krakow, taught himself English. The Americans hired him as a defense counsel for displaced persons in the Allied zone in southwest Germany. In an act that seems to me to be almost incomprehensible in its breathtaking optimism, my parents transcended the inhumanity they'd experienced and decided to have two more children. I was the first of them, born in Stuttgart on July 1st, 1946, a few months after the Nuremberg trials started and came to Canada with my family in 1950, a few months after the trials ended. You cannot be born in the shadow of the Holocaust to two Jews who survived it without an exaggerated commitment to the pursuit of justice. You cannot grow up indifferent to a just rule of law when every adult you loved experienced the horror of its subversion. And you cannot live a life without idealism when the very fact of your birth reflects a tenacious belief by parents whose only son had been one of the war's six million martyrs to injustice, that the world would turn fairer. My father died a month before I finished law school and never lived to see his inspiration take flight in his daughter's passion for justice, or meet the two grandsons who followed his path and became lawyers. But he never for one moment gave up hope, because living as a Jew in Canada made him feel safe, and how right he was. My life started in a country where there had been no democracy, no rights, no justice. No one with this history does not feel lucky to be alive and free. No one with this history takes anything for granted. And no one with this history does not feel that we all have a particular duty to wear our identities with pride and to promise our children that we will do everything humanly possible to keep the world safer for them than it was for their grandparents. A world where all children, regardless of race, color, religion, or gender, can wear their dignities, their identities with dignity, pride, and peace. And that's why getting this award from the Holy Blossom, a shul dedicated to Jewish values and social justice, in honor of a man who represented the best of those values, means the world to me. Thank you, Rabbi Splansky, for your warm generosity. And thank you, Holy Blossom, for honoring me by letting me share a platform with the spirit of the great Gunther Plout. Thank you.
Q&A. Thank you for that. We will have uh, a chance for questions from the congregation, but um, I have a few of my own. In fact, I have 18. <laughs> but I have I'll... to catch a plane tonight at 11 <laughs> o'clock. So on this uh, beautiful and fragile award is inscribed the verse from Deuteronomy, Tzedek, Tzedek, Tirdof, justice, justice shall you pursue. And our sages ask why justice twice? Why the repetition when Torah doesn't waste any time or any space? So one answer is um, to teach that justice is hard and that you have to try again and again. Another explanation is that justice is at the core of Judaism. Justice, justice shall you pursue. So my first question for you, Justice Sabella, is um, do you see your justice seeking as an expression of your Judaism? Do you see it as a, a religious obligation in addition to a career? Uh, that's a very good question. I think one of the things we all come to understand is that we grow into our adulthood and in, in doing that we grow into our parents in ways that we don't realize. So I literally was four when I decided I was going to be a lawyer, but I had no idea, as Justice Conway said, what that meant. It just struck me as so unfair that he couldn't be something that he was, so I was going to do it, the revenge of the refugee. Um, but I didn't know what justice meant until, because, because my own life, really, despite everything you've heard, was extraordinarily privileged. We, we weren't wealthy, but I had two very happy parents. Um, I never saw demons. They never complained about what they'd been through. They openly talked about everything. Um, I didn't even know my mother had been wealthy until I asked my grandmother around Pesach in, when I was 11 or 12, why are you and Granny such terrible cooks? And she said, because we had people cook for us. And I said, you're kidding. I had no idea. So I grew up very happy and very optimistic and very um, certain that life was good because my life was the insularity that comes from being protected. And then I started reading books and books were my tutor into what life was like. And I, as much as I, I will go to see any movie anywhere, I've seen Howard the Duck. That's an idea of how low my standard is for movies. <laughs> But books always, I needed a good book from the time I was very young. And I remember when I read Les Miserables, I was 12, I think. And there, for the first time, I understood what injustice was. That somebody who had stolen a loaf of bread to help his sister and her child because they had no money. Uh, and yet he spent 19 years in jail, even at 12. It seemed to me extraordinary. So the connection between the four-year-old who said she wanted to do law and the 12-year-old who came to see what injustice was connected. And I saw that being a lawyer was about making sure there was justice. I don't know how to do that except um, watching other people do it. Uh, it's a process, and it will never stop. I mean, it's to me, it's not ensuring justice. It's ensuring the ongoing reduction of injustice. Um, but I'm always fascinated by rabbis who tell me what phrases in the Bible means. I, I didn't know whether it was a typo, justice, justice, <laughs> shall you pursue. So that's a very good theory, but I think who I am the being Jewish, understanding that being Jewish was something um, 
that made you different and taking enormous pride in being different. I mean, we, we were not assimilationists in my house. We were not um, try to be like everybody else. I never wanted to be like anybody else. I liked who we were. And um, it wasn't until I got much older and hit the world that I realized that there were law firms Jews had not been allowed to go to, hospitals Jews were not allowed to go to, well, countries Jews were not allowed to go, as you know from Irving Abella's uh, and Hestrober's, none is too many. So that all came much later, but in the meantime, it was a drive towards fixing things that felt unfair. So injustice is unfairness, and justice to me is reducing unfairness and making the world, everybody's world, each world, problem by problem, fairer. Another text today, the Haftarah reading comes from the prophet Isaiah, this morning's Haftarah. We have Isaiah in the window there. Yeah, I recognized him. <laughs> That's pretty good. And he said, cry out with a full throat. Do not hold back. Let your voice resound like a shofar. If you remove lawlessness from your midst, the pointing finger, the malicious word, then your light will shine in the darkness and your night become bright as noon. So my question for you is, has there been a time when you felt like a shofar? No. When you felt like a lone voice? No, never. I never have. I never have because I never looked around to see who was with me. I wasn't leading a parade. I was saying what I wanted to say because I felt I should say it. And I had, I mean, my father died before I finished law school, but my mother was around for another 40 years. She was always there for me. And I have uh, Irving Abella, I had two sons, and family is, is the core of what protects you. So I never felt alone. We have wonderful friends. I have felt the subject of enormous criticism and controversy, but I think that's appropriate. I think when you, when you say to the status quo, this isn't the way it should be, you're, a, you're stepping on a lot of toes of people who are very comfortable with the status quo. Um, so that never surprised me. It never endangered me. Um, and over time, what was a controversy 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, now I'm getting Gunther Plout Awards for. So um, I, I have never really felt that I was out there on my own. I'm not, a, I'm a voice, but I'm a voice in a choir of like-minded people all over the world. You're, you're a like-minded person. I think this congregation is full of like-minded people. And I'll tell you something else interesting that I only came to realize later. I always felt the Jewish community was there. I, I never felt really out of step with the Jewish community. I don't know how that works because public opinion is one of those phrases that we all use, but I have no idea what that means. I mean, who is the public? Like, this is part of the public. I know who my friends are and what they think, but I don't know what the real public is. But the Jewish community has always felt um, very embracing and very generous all the way through my life. Um, and certainly in my career. So as much as I would like to say, yes, it was lonely, it was hard, I was out there on my own, and oh my God, it was so terrible. Uh, it was a privilege to have the opportunity to say and do the things that I had to say and do. And I didn't know or care whether one day I would end up on a Supreme Court of Canada. In fact, if I'd worried about that for five seconds, I wouldn't have done any of the things that I would have, that I did because I would have been afraid that they'd get in the way of my career. So um, I think you learn from Holocaust survivors not to be afraid, just to be who you are and the world will take you or not, but they don't get to define you, you do. That's an extraordinary answer. Uh, during the High Holy Days, we 
reflect on the themes of Deen, which is justice, judgment, and on the other hand, Rachamim is compassion. And I'm not sure if everyone realizes, but on Kol Nidre, we're actually acting out a court scene. Ooh. So God is the judge on high, and the Torah scrolls that are taken out from the Aron HaKodesh stand as witnesses to testify against us. And we are standing trial with our sins and our acts of goodness in our hands. And we pray that God will forfeit some justice, some deen, some strict judgment to make room for compassion so that we can be forgiven because we are imperfect. And God knows that because God built us that way. So my question for you, as a human judge on the highest court in the land, what role does compassion play, if any, in the pursuit of justice? I remember many years ago, and some of you may remember too, there was a debate going on in the United States, which is such a different country now than it was. But in the 90s, uh, especially, there was a lot of discussion about whether judges were biased if they had a point of view. It, it always struck me as astonishing. We don't want people who are essentially, what they were saying is, we don't want human rights people. We want people who are neutral. In other words, forget this compassion stuff. Just look at the word, see what the word says. And what they were really saying was, we don't like when you protect rights. That's what they were saying to their courts. So the notion of justice without compassion makes no sense to me at all. So I told you what I learned from reading books. I had clients when I practiced law, and I learned about life from them that I didn't know existed in my own life. I learned that they went from the day's drudgery to the evening's despair. And I was a young mother. I had a, a newborn and a th three-year-old when I became a family court judge. And with these two children of my own at home, I was deciding every day for seven years whether to take other people's babies away. Now, the side story is when Roy McMurtry called and said, do you want to be a family court judge? Um, I, had, I had never met any judges when I was 29 years old, only the ones that I had appeared before. So I, I asked my friends in the legal profession, is this a good thing? And they said, no, you can't do that. The family court is the lowest court in the country. You'll never, one day if you stick with practicing law, you're good, pretty good at it. You could be on the trial division uh, of Ontario. And I said, they want me to do this. I think it's great. I'm gonna do it. And it's where I learned to exercise compassion, not to be compassionate, because I think in my house it would have been impossible not to have those instincts. But I learned to listen in a very different way because I didn't bring home my own family and I didn't look top down at those people who were going through these despairing lives. I learned to listen to their stories, what they were telling me and come up with a decision that I thought wouldn't do them further damage than they were already experiencing. Those lessons that I learned, and I, as far as I knew, I was gonna stay on that court for the rest of my life. The lessons that I learned have helped me, including on this court, because I have learned always to look at the problem from the point of view of the people who are telling you the story. Not what do I think, not what is my life. What are they saying is happening in theirs? Uh, so I'm forever grateful that I had the chutzpah to accept a judgeship at 29 because I learned how to be a judge from this lowest court in the country where real people were going to the courts and saying, please help me not make my life worse. You know, you learn, you learn everything you do teaches you. And what that taught me about young lawyers, and if there are any in this room, 
I always say, don't take anybody's advice. <laughs> because I would never have been a lawyer because everybody said girls aren't lawyers. Um, fine. And there weren't. When, I, when JJ, who's sitting in the front row, was born, I didn't know any women lawyers who were mothers. None. None. But I did it anyway. And I did all these things in a career that went like that. Um, and knew people who started in a law firm after law school and ended up on a court, and that's where they wanted to go, and they're very good judges. But I've had a mosaic of justice that's been wonderful. So on that journey of justice, I have never stopped thinking about those people who come to court for compassion, for somebody who listens with an open mind, not an empty one. So going back to, are we prejudiced? Are we biased if we're compassionate and care about people's rights? I think the answer to that is, we're biased if we're not open to their rights and what they're, what they're going through. So I, it was a very chilling conversation to hear because judges are supposed to be neutral and they are neutral and impartial, but that doesn't mean not paying attention to what the purpose of law and justice are. Thank you. Is that right, Justice Conway? <laughs> <laughs> See, my court of appeal. <laughs> so I have many more questions here, but I know um, folks in the congregation also do. So maybe with the help of Avra and Rob, we'll uh, take some questions from the crowd. Should I just start? Are there any questions? That's I can? Good. Thank you. Clearly, you've had a very storied career. Can you think of, we all have experiences that resonate over time, one, two, or three cases in your career which have left indelible marks on you? you know, that's, that's such a good question, and the answer is no. <laughs> And I don't know why that is. I mean, the other question I get asked a lot is, is, do you have any regrets? And the answer to that is no as well. I don't feel that I, every single case I have, especially now in the last 15 years on the Supreme Court, where we just don't get any cases that are easy. I mean, they're all complicated and I have to do every case with eight other people. And I don't know if you know what that's like, but. <laughs> having to make every important decision with the same eight people every day <laughs> who didn't pick you and you didn't pick them. It's like having eight husbands. And you, <laughs> and you know how hard it is sometimes to decide with a husband where you're going for dinner. So this is, should we have assisted dying in the country? I mean, they may be. Um, so I, I have had defining moments, I can tell you clients I remember. Uh, the family court was defining. Traveling across, the Royal Commission that she talked about was also defining because I had by then been on the Ontario Human Rights Commission when uh, Lloyd Axworthy appointed me as a 37-year-old provincial court judge to travel across the country and determine whether there were barriers in employment for women, indigenous people, persons with disabilities, and visible minorities. And I knew how seriously the government was taking this one year, one million dollar royal commission because there was at the same time a four year, seven person royal commission headed by a court of appeal judge on baby seals. So, <laughs> um, but I was gonna do it and I did it and what I learned there just as I had learned about a slice of Canadian life in the family court, traveling across country, the country in, I think I went to 17 cities in six weeks with one break, which I'll tell you about in a minute, because it goes to family. I thought I was, as somebody who'd been on the commission, pretty good at figuring out what discrimination was, but I don't think there was a meeting I was in across the country 
when I was listening to indigenous people or minorities or persons with disabilities especially, I knew about women, that didn't uh, shake me to the core about what they were experiencing and how difficult their lives were and how frustrating it was for them and how arbitrary the barriers were for them. So that's another one. Let me tell you the side story. So in the middle of this cross country tour, our younger son was turning seven. And so I flew from Calgary to New York because I had two tickets for cats for him. And so we all went down to New York. So this is, this is the thing about being, I think, well, Jewish, female, professional. You're all of those things, but you're still a mother. So, of course, we had to take him to see cats for his seventh birthday, and even though I'm in the middle of the Royal Commission. So his older brother and his father went to see Never Say Never Again, a James Bond movie. He loved James Bond. I said to my son, don't tell him where you're going, because these tickets were really hard to get, 1983. It cost me a fortune, so don't take because he's going to want to go with you. So we went to see cats. He liked it. First thing JJ says when we get out of the theater is, we saw never say never again. And he cried all the way back to the hotel. So here I am, this important commissioner, but I don't know how to console the seven-year-old. I just stuck my neck out to get these seats for him, and he was upset. Anyway, so, so I remember my life. It, it is a weaving of, of law and justice and friends, but mostly family. What was the hardest challenge you had to overcome? Um, very good question. Uh, the hardest challenge I had to overcome was learning how to cook. <laughs> and I haven't overcome it yet. So it's a pleasure to hear you speak and to uh, uh, see and, and to be part of Holy Blossom offering you this award. I think it's wonderful. Um, one of the questions I came to mind is, um, as women, we are sometimes described um, as having somewhat different decision-making processes or leadership processes, maybe a little bit more collaborative rather than sort of uh, more straightforward. I'm wondering if that has been your experience, and if so, how that may have shaped uh, how you've um, gone forward. You know, I, I really don't know what the answer is to that. I've seen, uh, I've been in room fulls, rooms full of women where you don't even have to finish a sentence because we were all on the same page. I've had the same experience in rooms full of men. I've had experiences with some women that have been very difficult because I don't know if we even have that anymore, but in the early days, they used to call it the queen bee syndrome. I'm, I made it every, any woman can, found that frustrating. I found some of the most um, feminist support came from men. So, what have I found? I have found there is, when I got to the Supreme Court, there were four women for the first time. And a friend of mine from Manitoba said he went down to, the, to Australia and they said, oh my God, four women on the court, there goes the merit system. Uh, and now we've had 10 on the Supreme Court of Canada. The Americans have only ever had four. Um, we worked hard at collegiality the four of us. And it was easy to do because our colleagues were so collegial. Uh, but it was something we put our minds to. I don't know if that's because we were women or because we were those, those women who got along with each other. Uh, my mother worked very hard at relationships with people and I watched her and I always thought it's better to try to get along than not. Um, but I've also discovered the older I get uh, that you can transcend differences sometimes, uh, but sometimes the differences are so deep and the barriers so strong uh, that it's hard to do. So I don't know, I always wanted to look for that. That's like the holy grail of the feminist movement. Like we're different, we're better. Well, we're different and, and we do some things more easily. 
The only thing I've discovered in all of these years about women that was once true and remains true for me, there's no such thing as work-life balance. I just wish they'd stop talking about how you lean in, lean up, lean down, lean inside. <laughs> it's impossible. Being, being a, a woman is kids come first and work comes first and your parents come first and your husband comes first and your work comes first and they all come first. And, and if some weeks you don't get time to see a movie, forget about it. It's not going to happen until your kids are 40. So I think to, we got to get off this idea that there's this perfect way that can only happen if we have wives, and we don't. <laughs> now, my, my other secret weapon is marry a history professor who loves his children because he'll, he'll take the load. The kids think they had two mothers and one had a beard. I just want everyone to know that when the notorious RBG was asked about Justice Abella, she said that you are her most dearest sisters-in-law, that she calls you her sister-in-law, which I thought was adorable. Uh, you sort of stole my question a little bit, but I'll go for it anyway. Um, in, just until a few minutes ago, uh, the word feminism hadn't been mentioned at all um, as we were sitting here. And that really struck me sitting, um, especially watching, seeing the two of you sitting on the BIMA, these two incredible female role models. So I was wondering if you could speak specifically about how um, feminism played a role as you pursued your career and as you um, made decisions throughout. So I went to law school in 1967. There were five women in the law school class of 150 people. There were 15 of us who were called to the bar out of 520 in 1972. Within 10 years, women were almost 50% of the law school classes. And what started to happen was the 60s dislocated all of our social concepts, remember? We started to reevaluate our parents. Remember, don't trust anybody over 30. So that left lingering conversations in Canada about what do we do about the law? Is the law, which had been static for 100 years. Like, I never heard the word discrimination or human rights in law school. It just never came up. It wasn't law. It wasn't contracts or torts or criminal law. So in 1970, in the 70s, women's movements, and there has always been a women's movement, every generation has had one, started to scream about the property laws. The property laws said, and most women didn't even know because until 1968, you couldn't even get a divorce. So if, you, if you're never gonna divorce, what do you care about what the law is about what happens to you when you get a divorce and you're a woman? Well. Once we got the divorce laws in 1968, people started to separate and discovered, if they were women, that they had no rights. Because the social conventions had said to women, the husband is the breadwinner, you stay home, which was a reasonable choice, they didn't know what happened when they separated and they had no income stream. So unless they were morally pure, uh, not guilty of any offense, marital offense, perfect mothers, um, they were at risk of not having the income to live decent lives. And the, the property laws were, if you contributed to the property, you could get a share. But of course, they weren't earning any money, so they couldn't contribute to any property. That changed in 1973, and um, the beginning of the conversation changed in 73, in a decision of the Supreme Court of Canada. Now, many court decisions that we disagree with start conversations, which is an interesting phenomenon. So this was a case called Murdoch, Murdoch and Murdoch. And Irene Murdoch was a farm wife who'd been married for about 25 years out in Alberta and worked the farm with her husband, did everything he did. Um, but of course, he did put the money into the farm, and so when she tried to get a share of the farm, 
the court said, sorry, um, and she said, my husband always called it hours. And one judge actually said on the trial division, when a husband says hours, I think he means mine. <laughs> that, was, that was a different judiciary. But Bor Alaskan wrote a dissent, and he said, that's not fair. We should have a concept of constructive trust, where if your work enriches someone else, you should get a share. But he was, it was a dissent, eight to one. Five years later, before we ever had a Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Brian Dixon, who became the Chief Justice of Canada later, changed the law and had a wonderful quote saying, times have changed, the roles of married women have changed, marriage is an economic and social partnership of equals, and that's the way the division should be. And that was feminism from two, from two male judges, and then every province in the country changed the property laws to make them more equitable. Conversations were going around at the time. Are you a feminist? Aren't you a feminist? Well, I believe in women's rights, but I'm not a feminist because if you're a feminist, then you're a horrible person and you wear Oxford shoes and you never wear mascara. What? <laughs> so the debate about what feminism meant took away a lot of energy from the real issue, which was how people were coming to recognize that rights for women had to improve. I used to get calls all the time from the press when I became a judge and before, tell us how you manage this work-life thing. And I said, I'm not giving you an interview. I have a great husband. I got two wonderful kids. My mother lives five minutes away. My husband's whole salary goes to a nanny. You're asking me how I manage? Why don't you ask the women who go to an underpaid job during the day, if they have a job, come home and for no money, do the cooking and the cleaning and the laundry and then get up at five in the morning and schlep their kid to a daycare because there's no daycare. Ask them how they manage and then I'll give you an interview. Well, so, um, so feminism. I think, I see feminism, believe it or not, as a gender neutral term. As a term that means being respectful of the rights of women uh, to be who they want, what they want, without arbitrary barriers in the way. I don't see that as revolutionary. I, I would say the same thing about every group, uh, but they don't have the label. So I, I like to think we've moved past the word causing a conversation, yeah, but are you really, because it, it is not inconsistent with loving men to be a big supporter of rights for women. And I think that's one thing we finally come to realize. And that's, that's a good development because we were wasting a lot of energy on rhetoric instead of substance. Hi. Um, I know we've spoken a lot about the turbulence um, internationally with the perception of human rights and justice. Um, but at the core still, we have these same issues of environmentalism, gender equality, um, accessibility, and indigenous uh, issues within the law. Um, as a young person who is in law school and will be, fingers crossed, entering the legal profession very soon, or I was wondering if you could give some advice about I guess if you see, where you see the role being for young lawyers or even young people in general in advancing these issues? I told you I don't believe in giving people advice, but I will, I, but I will tell you this. I have seen people go to law schools and come out with enormous debt. Well, any university. Uh, and so the idea of having a privilege to just go out and do, hang up a shingle and say, I'm an environmental lawyer or I'm an indigenous lawyer. Um, I will in a minute tell you a story I shouldn't tell you about how I decided to be a family court judge and took a pay cut of 60%, but maybe not because he's sitting in the front row and he doesn't like that story. <laughs> um, I think what you have to do is is stay in touch with what you care about and believe in wherever you go. I don't think human rights is the preserve of human rights lawyers. I think it's all of us. 
And if you're a corporate lawyer or a tax lawyer or a, a criminal lawyer, those values should be inside you no matter what you do. They may not play out on the page, but they're in you. They're in how you treat other people in your, in your law firm. They're in how you treat your friends and family. They're in how you read a newspaper and how, what that makes you think about. So silos are not necessarily available. Um, but I remember being younger and saying, I'm going to be a geriatric lawyer. I'm going to help old people because I love my grandmother. I didn't even know what that meant. And, and in fact, there wasn't any such thing at the time. But all of the things that I cared about just have stayed in a little bundle in me. And sometimes the environmental issue comes out. That took me a long time. That took me a really long time. Um, sometimes it's, it's uh, the, the concern for people who are poor sometimes, but it's all in there and I just, it comes out at different times. So don't worry about whether you're going to go to the right law firm at the beginning. You know, you may have to go to five or six places before you find a place you're really comfortable with. And if that's the case, that's fine. You don't have to stay where you start. You're a different person. And you don't know if those people are going to work out for you. The key to me is always, can I be myself here? Can I be really happy? Can I give it everything? Uh, and do they appreciate that I want to give it everything? They may disagree with me, but and if they don't, you're in the wrong place. Move on. There's never going to be a problem finding something to do if you go to law school. I've never met anyone who said, I'm really sorry I went to law school, but a lot of people who said, I'm sorry I didn't. And you may decide not to be a lawyer. You may decide to be a journalist or a rabbi or a doctor. It's just one phase of education. So don't be planning the end of your career. Hi there. I do not have a question, <laughs> but I do have a statement. It'll be short, Linda. Um, you show a number of traits that are rare and difficult. And I just wanted to touch upon them. People that do this are, are great human beings and great managers. You have the capacity to listen to people and get into their skin. To experience what their experience is like without being judgmental or without saying that's stupid. But you don't lose yourself in them. You don't become them. You don't know what it's, it's you're not saying what it would be like for you to be in their shoes. You, you get to what it's like for them to be in their shoes. And at the same time, you use another skill that's kind of paradoxical. You can be firm and you can set limits, which is difficult to do if you are feeling the other people's life. So I, I just wanted to comment on that. And in addition, you're funny. <laughs> That's and good to tell, hear. Yeah, and you're and you're a storyteller. Thank you. Mazel tov. Hi, Rosie. Karen. Hi. Um, it's always an uh, an honor and a thrill to hear you. You opened your remarks by speaking about the time in which we find ourselves now and the chaos and the concerns that you have. And the rabbi asked about justice as a Jewish value and how Jewishness informs what you do. As usual, I agree with everything you say and I'm not asking for advice because I know you won't give it. I might to you. <laughs> and I've always accepted it even when we were sitting in the uh, doctor's office together. I'm worried, especially because of the polarization in our own Jewish community, which has always been there for me, too. 
and as a source of comfort and strength. But the polarization now on what I think both of us would consider issues of justice, I'm concerned when we as a community have benefited so much from immigration and know what it means to come from war-torn countries and I hear the anti-immigration stance or equality and justice and how we strived when we couldn't make it. And now I'm feeling that some of that is unraveling and our own Jewish values perhaps are not informing us all the way that you would hope and your exemplary career has shown. Um, would you share some thoughts on that? Because the delicate balance, that's what human rights are all about. You taught us that. I think this is, a, I mean, that's a very deep question. The polarization in the Jewish community, I don't know that that's, that I'm in a position to deal with that, except I will tell you this. What I find in young people that really worries me, uh, especially on the human rights side, which is a bit odd, isn't it, coming from me, is an unwillingness to understand that you can be human rights oriented and still be pro-Israel. That you can be human rights oriented and still be opposed to hate speech on campus that you can be um, human rights oriented and stand up for your right to be very Jewish. And I see, I worry, I mean, what I worry about on the right is so obvious uh, that I don't even know what to say. The, the indifference, the, um, the insensitivity, the unwillingness to share, uh, to see how how it feels to be so cruel or to be the victim of cruelty. But I, in the Jewish community, just reading what I read about, um, especially in the United States, scares me because I think the assimilationist model, um, as opposed to the integrationist model, being in the community as a Jew, is something Canada does very well because we have, a, we have multiculturalism. Our different identities are allowed to come into the mainstream and stay different. The Americans are a melting pot society, and so you almost have to choose who you're gonna to be to melt, which is ridiculous, because if you're not white, you're not gonna melt, and if you're in a wheelchair, you're not gonna melt, uh, and if you're a woman, you get pregnant and guys don't. So you have to have your differences acknowledged. They don't do that well. So the Jewish American communities, it seems to be, may be folding into that assimilationist model and to be part of the community that they want to see, a human rights community, they are leveling their Jewishness out of the picture. And that's tragic because everything that happened in Normandy was so they could be Jewish. They don't have to like everything about being Jewish, and they certainly don't have to like everything about the government in Israel. I don't. But Israel exists for a reason, and it deserves our support and our commitment and not being embarrassed to say it in front of people. In 1956, I was debating between whether I should be a psychologist or a lawyer. I didn't really know what psychologists did other than they taught university classes. But the prevailing view was, if you were a lawyer, you're going to make a lot of money. That would be nice. <laughs> I'm retiring in two years, maybe. On the first day of law school, the professor got up and said, if you want to be a successful lawyer, you have to love law as if it's your mistress. And this particular professor, we found out, did have a mistress. 
Well, I found out I was unsuitable and I resigned because they were teaching me things I didn't want to be. It's all about adversarial relationships. And the best relationships are win-win, not win-lose. So my question is, in listening to your opening comments, it was all about values. And my question is, how do people enter law school with values that are unknown? Why is the reputation of lawyers such a negative one as opposed to a positive one? So my question is, what's the process by which people get admitted to law school? Is there anything other than marks and whatever else they might bring to find out whether they have some of the kinds of values that you've been talking about that make a difference in our human relationships? Whether it's of any type of lawyer, there are some basic values that should be respected and I'm wondering, are the law schools aware of that or do you have any influence with the curriculum or the interview process by which the right people get into law school? It's Absolutely no influence at all. Uh, the legal profession, as long as, as early as Shakespeare, remember, let's kill all the lawyers, has never enjoyed the love of the community. But I've been a lawyer since 1970 and I have never for a minute not felt really proud to be a lawyer. I learned a lot at law school. I didn't learn much about life at law school, but I learned about life from life. Um, most of the people I went to law school with were really wonderful. Most lawyers are wonderful. Uh, they're in a very tough spot now that I am not in. I don't have to worry about overhead or getting clients, so it's luxurious for me. Uh, and I don't know what it feels like to be under the stress, the economic stress that they're under but I still see law as a noble profession. Actually, every profession is a noble profession, but because law is supposed to be about justice, and justice is the application of law to life, you're right, you have to know life to know what to do with law. And it may be that law schools should be doing that more, but they're producing very decent people. And I just hope they don't get mugged by so much reality that they lose the values they came into law school with. But I'm very proud to be a lawyer. At the beginning of your comments, you painted a very bleak uh, picture of the present world situation and the trajectory for the future. Martin Luther King, uh, once said, and it was often quoted by Obama, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Do you have reason to maintain any level of optimism at this point? Nope. <laughs> I, I do for Canada. I do for, I mean, you'll forgive me if I say that the most important thing in my life is my family. Uh, I am deeply proud of them and the fact that we're, I just know how lucky we are. But about the world, no. And it's because we are refusing to have a conversation about the only institution that we set up to deal with what's happening around the world. And it's failing miserably and everybody in the human rights world is saying, yeah, but the UN is all we have. To which I say, that doesn't mean it's the best we can do. 40 million people have died in conflict since the United Nations was set up in 1946. It is now a country where, uh, uh, an institution where, rather than doing what it was supposed to do, setting the minimal standards and norms of global civility and decency and dignity, it's a place where it's a majoritarian institution where the people who have no democracy are setting the rules for the rest of us. And so what gets tolerated? The intolerable. And I can't have this conversation with people in the human rights world because they're just so frightened about what's going to happen if we don't have the UN. And you know there's a legal test, I don't know if there are any lawyers here, the but-for test, how you decide if somebody's uh, responsible for negligence, would it have happened but-for? So I think the agencies of the UN are doing an amazing job. But, but for the UN, 
Can you think of anything that didn't happen that they would have, anything that happened that they could have prevented? Yes, a million. Um, did they play any kind of role in shaping the world into a good place? Maybe until Doug Hammarskjöld. But since then, every country is doing whatever it wants. There are red lines in the sand all over the world, and they're being crossed as if they weren't even there. So by the time the Security Council gets around to saying maybe we should say something about Syria, and it took ages, 600,000 people are dead. So we debate, we discuss, we dissemble, we write, we rage, we say this is terrible, and this big behemoth in New York where everybody gets together and feels really good that it exists is doing nothing that the world needs to keep it safe. So that's why I'm pessimistic, because there is not a willingness to do what we did in 1946 when we got rid of the League of Nations because it failed. So I'm not sure the UN isn't where the League of Nations was, 1945. And there's no other place where countries can go and be subjected to the standards of humanity that we decided were going to prevail after the Second World War. So, I mean, that makes me really despondent. Plus, I see Poland and Hungary and Turkey and England and closer places. Um, and it just, oh, it's like a domino effect. And I don't know, nothing is stopping it. Nothing is stopping it. And that makes me think maybe it could have if the UN years ago had said, uh, this is not okay, you're out if you behave like this. But nobody's out, everybody's in, and they're telling us. Uh, they are um, treating their children, their women, their, I mean, it's just unconscionable to me that we've allowed this to happen in post-World -world, post War II global, um, a global environment. So now they're starting to worry about the environment, which is great. And uh, you know, the irony to me, they set up the World Trade Organization in 1995 with the Marrakesh Agreement. And it works. And you had to apply for 10, China spent 10 years trying to get into the WDO before it got in. You had to show that you deserve to be a member of the WDO. It's gone a little funny now because there's a president who doesn't think it's such a great idea, but for a long time it was working and it had an enforcement mechanism. 1995. We set up these human rights institutions and bodies in 1948. So what, what economic trade regulations have deemed important enough to get up and running in, what, 25 years? We haven't been able to do for human rights in 70. I think that's a problem. And this business about, it's none of our business, domestic sovereignty, who are we to tell Syria what to do, who are we to tell Sudan what to do, that ended with the Second World War. That's why we have genocide and crimes against humanity. That, that conversation ended. States saying, you can't touch me, I can, I can rule with impunity. So, I'm sorry to end on, on, a, on a, such a, worried no but it is a somber day so maybe that's not a bad thing so it is jewish custom to end with a nechemta with a uh, an uplifting word of comfort so i want to come back to this award um, it's crafted by a local artist who crafted the ner tamid that we have in our new library and in our new uh, mishkan a, a prayer space on the second floor so I want you to know that this is a symbol of an er tamid, an eternal light, and that we see you as an eternal light. And we are so admiring of you and so grateful for all that you do and all that you are and all that you give. And you do give us hope, even with your, um, your words of realism just now, you do give us hope knowing that um, there are people like you in positions where change can happen. So with that, I turn now to Avra Rosen, Vice President of the Congregation, to conclude. 
Justice Isabel, I've been a lawyer since 1987. I'm a family law lawyer. I have so many questions. You raised constructive trust. I won't go there right now. Uh, some of my colleagues are in this room right now. We could really go for a long time, but let me conclude first by thanking. Um, first, let's start with the uh, Gunter Plout, W. Gunter Plout Humanitarian Award and Ron Steiner who spoke beautifully uh, from the committee. I joined Holy Blossom in 1985, the same year I graduated from law school, so there's lots of hope. <laughs> um, and I remember him standing on the bima, and as many of you will remember, he would stand, you could drop a pin, nobody heard a word, and he'd look all the way up in that back corner and say, can you hear me up there? Because yes, he was a terrific orator, orator. He was an outstanding rabbi, a humanitarian, and to have you on this bima where he stood and to receive this award is really truly an honor of the congregation. I'd like to thank. I'd like to thank the Bernstein family for speaking in their uh, kind words and about uh, Rene Cassin. That's the Montrealer in me. Um, thank you for making this event uh, so meaningful to us and for your family. Of course, Justice Conway, who I have appeared before in a family law context when she sits on the ninth floor, which is not too often. Um, outstanding uh, introduction, because it gave us a real understanding of who you are, Justice Abella, not just uh, as a justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, but a humanitarian, as Justice Conway described, about your compassion um, and how you started out at 29 years of age on the, what I still call the, you know, OCJ, Ontario Court of Justice, uh, where you are today. Uh, you broke all the glass ceilings for my generation, for me to practice law and never once think about what it meant to be a woman, but to just be a family law lawyer and do the best for my clients and have compassion and be an advocate in the Superior Court of Justice and the Ontario Court of Appeal. I haven't made Supreme Court of Canada yet. Um, it's because of you. Wow. Well, <laughs> what you don't know, if all of you have watched RBG, we have a mandatory retirement age for judges at 75. So Justice Abella has a few years to go. I'm not sure I'm going to make, I wasn't going to say anything. To, I'm not sure I'm going to make it there. And that's a good thing because that's a, at a client's expense. If you look at it from the other side, how do the clients pay for us to keep going to the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court of Canada? But I just want to close by thanking you for what you've done, not just for the legal profession, but for women, for Jews, uh, for our community. We are so proud to have you here at Holy Blossom and you always have a home here. <laughs>